Ronnie for uh, for sharing and <clears throat> singing that beautiful song. And Ronnie's been singing and singing that song since 8.30 this morning, so we're going to let him rest his, his voice. We've had some wonderful messages already in our service today, haven't we? Many, many messages, many sermons. And um, you may think you've had enough, but I'm going to give you one more. You got to wait. Because I from the Lord as well. As uh, Susan said in her wonderful prayer, we have been looking at what it means to be a biblical member of the body of Jesus Christ this winter. What it means to be a member of church. Many of you have been discussing this in your small groups. Many of you have talked to me about some of the discussions and, and what it's meant and and how it's uh, made a difference looking at yourselves of what the Bible says is about being a church member. We've looked at many things to be a functioning member, to, to be a unifying member, to, to be a praying member, to go and, and, and interact and, and move within our church life knowing that church is not about our own preferences, our own desires, but it's about the will of God. Many important things. And this morning, as we finish up this series, we want to talk about how church membership is a treasure. How being a part of a body of Christ, of finding a local body of Christ, is a treasure that God gives us. And sometimes I know that maybe in your life, it just doesn't feel that way. Maybe on the spectrum, let me ask you a question. Now, when you come to church on a Sunday morning, does being here at church bring you joy? I mean, that's a 10 on the scale, right? It brings you joy, and you're smiling, and your heart is full, and you look forward to seeing others. Or maybe on the other end of the scale, and, and sometimes we're there, does getting up and coming to church on a Sunday morning maybe bring you stress? It brings you anxiety. Uh, maybe it's a, it's a day of the week that, that's come to you that, that maybe coming to Fairview or going to your local church is a burden. It's, uh, it's where you feel overworked, where you feel overextended, or maybe you feel burnt out. Church can become that way, can it? It can become that way. You know, do you look forward to serving? Do you look forward to attending? Do you look forward to being on mission? And is it you just can't wait to help this little baby and their family at our oyster roast this year? You can't wait to to serve in the food pantry, serve through Micah breakfast. Uh, serve our community and help people in Jesus' name? Or is it just a burden? Sometimes when it feels that way, we need to, to readjust. We need to, um, to look again within ourselves and, and realize the treasure that we have being together. And I hope and pray that, that your attitude, which is what we're talking about here, is on the positive end of the scale today. But I know that we all have down times, don't we? We all have moments in life and seasons in life when we're burdened and we're burnt out and we need encouragement. And, and many times our lives are like Ronnie's that, boy, it seems like everybody we know and the people we love the dearest are, are just having problems. And we're having problems. And and we don't want to take those to church, but we do. We need to take them so God can give us solace and encourage us, but we still come with the downhearted times. That happens. And it's during these seasons that we can be reminded how privileged we are as Christians. How do we find that joy again? Well, uh, Paul, in one of his letters, I think, has some answers for us. It's a reminder to the church of, 
uh, remembering our joy and, and uh, remembering the privilege we have with Christ in our life. And turn with me in the word to Ephesians. Ephesians is in your New Testament. It's about two-thirds of the way near the back of your Bible. And in this uh, letter that Paul writes to Ephesus in the fourth chapter, Paul is, is, he's begun the letter to Ephesians by sharing with the church more theological truths, the meaning of salvation, the meaning of being the church and, and what that is and how they can be saved. And now he turns to the, the latter part of his letter. And as Paul usually does, he, he wants to get practical. But what he wants to do is begin this by sharing with the Christians then and us now to remind us of the great treasure we have of believing in Jesus and Jesus loving us and being a part of this church. And so let's look at a little bit of what he says this morning. The first thing he's going to say to us is that he reminds us to remember the call of our salvation, to remember the time when we first heard and accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. He begins like this in verse 1 of chapter 4. Paul says, as a prisoner for the Lord, then I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Paul, Ephesians is one of what we call the prison epistles. He's in prison in Rome as he writes this letter. He's in the end of, of his earthly ministry, but he's still thinking about the churches he's planted and that he loves. He's thinking about the young people that he's mentored, and he'll write some lovely letters to Timothy and to Titus. But sitting in that prison cell, he says, remember to live a life worthy of the calling. Paul is asking every believer to continually go back and remember their call. What is this call that he's talking about? Because that can have many meanings. Paul is not talking about here to go and remember uh, your call to Christian vocation and what God has asked you to do, those things that sometimes maybe burden you down because you do so many of them. He's not even asking right now for, for you to remember the gifts of the Holy Spirit that Jesus has given you and asked you to use. What he's asking you to remember is to remember the gospel call, to remember the call that each of you heard and responded to when Jesus called your name personally. He's asking you to remember when Jesus lovingly urged you to accept the gift of salvation and be forgiven your sin. Remember that day, that moment. He's asking you to remember the day or the time in your life when when you believed in Jesus as the risen king. He's asking you to remember the day that, that you committed to Jesus. Jesus, I'm going to make you Lord of my life, and I'm going to live for you the rest of my days. Can you remember that day? Can you remember that period of life, maybe? I was young. I, I don't remember everything about that day, but I remember what was going on in life, right? And how much a change it was when I knew a fresh salvation from Jesus, when, when I knew my call, that Jesus had called me to him. And man, I wanted to serve him with all I had. I meant it when I said, I want you to be Lord of my life. And, and Paul is saying, you know, the first thing to, to get back in our hearts to seeing church, being a part of the body of Christ as a treasure, is you've got to remember 
how great a moment your salvation was and how great salvation is in your life today. N.T. Wright interprets this little verse and passage like this. He says, because King Jesus has conquered death itself, all who give him their faithful allegiance are assured that the same victory will be theirs as well. This is the calling to which they must live up to every moment, in every decision, with every word and action. They are to be aware that the call to follow Jesus the Messiah and give him their complete loyalty takes precedent over everything else. That's how we felt when we first asked Christ in our heart. For many of us, it's how we still feel now. But as we said earlier, some things in life and over the years, we can, we can lose that love relationship with the Lord, can't we? And we've got to get back. And when we do, when we remember and pray daily a, a prayer of praise and thanksgiving to God for salvation, what we'll notice in our life, it'll bring us more joy, but it's also what keeps us humble. It what's, it's what allows us to treasure every, each other in the body of Christ. And that's why I think Paul follows up in verse 2. It, doesn't, it seems out of place at first, but it really doesn't. He says, be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Isn't that what we want to experience when we come to God's house, the church? Humility, gentleness, patience. We want to bear each other up with love. Every three or four months, sometimes five months, with my surgery, it's been eight months, I get together with a core group of, of Christian friends that I've known since the late 70s. We grew up doing missions together uh, on the peninsula, Newport News. And, and now we're scattered, but our mentor, Mike Haywood, is still around. He's, he's 76 and can outrun me in a race. He's doing great. But we gather every now and then, really for Mike, because we love him, but we love each other. Some of us, uh, one, got one man and his wife, they're a vet out in, uh, near West Point, and another is a retired pastor, another works at the mission board, another works in Richmond and goes to church there. We all got together last night at my house. And it was, you know, it's great to be, that's a body of Christ too, isn't it? And it's great to be with people, and, and everybody was just humble, gentle, patient. We bore up each other in love. Most every one of them visited me in the hospital from all those different points. Came by the house and took me out to lunch when I got home. And because we're, that's how we bear each other up when we're at the church. It's a treasure. And that comes from knowing our salvation in Jesus Christ. Second of all, Paul asks us to remember the grace gifts that Jesus has equipped each one of us with. <clears throat> First Corinthians, I believe, 12 talks about the gift of the Spirit. These are the gifts from Jesus. In verse 7, he begins like this, But to each one of us, grace has been given as Christ appointed it. These are Christ appointed grace. This is why it says when, when he ascended on high, he took cap, too many captives and gave gifts to his people. <clears throat> what does he ascended mean? Except that he also descended to the lower earthly regions. He who descended is the very one who ascended higher than all the heavens in order to fill the whole universe. Well, that sounds kind of complicated, doesn't it? <laughs> what is he talking about there? Well, Paul is reminding each of us what part we have in serving Jesus in his church. Let me break it down of what he's saying. In, in that verse 8, he's saying we can do all of this. We can be church. We can be humble. We can bear each other up because of the grace gifts Jesus left, left us when he ascended into heaven. He left us some great gifts. Jesus ascended 
into the highest heavens in the end of the Gospels, we read about it. At the beginning of Acts, we read about it. And he goes to sit at the right hand of God because heaven is where God is. And Jesus sits at the right hand of God. And so Paul uses this image. He quotes a psalm that's all about the people, the first century Jew would know exactly what he's talking about because this psalm is talking about Moses. And he plays on this ascending and descending. Now think about it. One of the great moments of Old Testament history. Moses does what? Moses goes from the lower valley and he ascends to the top of Mount Sinai, right? And up there, what happens? What is God giving? The law, the Ten Commandments. And he takes the Ten Commandments, they're on these two big tablets, and he descends to the bottom of the mountain and gives them to the people, and he gives the people the law of God. And Paul says, think about that with Jesus, it was a little bit opposite than that. Jesus was already on the mountaintop in heaven before the beginning of the world with God, and Jesus descended first and came to earth. He descended and became a human being in the flesh. He descended and humbled himself and became like us and was tempted and hurt and had pain and suffered and taught us and was crucified for our sin as a human being but as a son of God. And then God raised him from the dead and when he was resurrected he became king of kings and lord of lords because of what he had done. And after he had descended, he opposite of Moses. He ascended to heaven. And he didn't leave us with tablets of the law. Paul's saying here he ascended to the heavens and showered down upon us through the Holy Spirit grace gifts. Grace gifts. Not gifts of the law that we can never keep that shows us how far down we are, but the gifts of grace that can help us work together and be his body and tell his message and get support and healing and great miracles that Ronnie was pleading for before he sang his song. And what gifts does Jesus leave the church? Paul tells us, doesn't he? What are these grace gifts? Verse 11. So Jesus Christ himself gave the apostles the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up. The Christ-given gifts are those things. And it's another gift, another list of spiritual gifts in, in that each of you and I, we have one of these, at least one of these gifts. Each one of us here are somehow either apostles or prophets or pastors or evangelists or teachers. And Jesus gifts us with these gifts of grace that not that we can build up ourselves, not that we can be better than others, but why? So that the church, his body, will be built up so that the body of Christ will accomplish works of service, that will carry on the work of Jesus, that will proclaim the good news, that we will bear each other's burdens along the way and care for one another. So due to these wonderful and indescribable spiritual realities of salvation and grace and gifts, we the church are to guard and protect, the last part of this passage says, this is why one of the main things is we protect the unity of us believers so that we can function and serve Jesus most effectively. Verse 13, until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. That's our goals. 
to be unified and to be mature in Jesus Christ. That's what these gifts are to lead us towards. That's what we're to guard as his body, as we work. Why? Because immaturity gets us in trouble. Look what immaturity looks like in verse 14 following. Then we will no longer be infants, tossed back and forth by the ways and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people and their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. And from him the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. That's who the church is. We are every supporting ligament. <laughs> and we're to build ourselves up in love and the way we do that is each one of us, each part has to do its work. So near the top of our list as church is to protect our unity. And unity here, it's not everyone always agreeing on everything. That's never going to happen. I've never made a decision in a local church as a pastor. I've never said, we're going to do this and had 100% agreement. I used to wonder why for my first one month of pastoring. And then I realized it ain't ever going to happen because we're made up of different people. That's not unity. Unity is when we are all agreed to stay focused on the mission that Jesus Christ has given us. To go ye therefore and make disciples of the world. And the more effective we come as Christ's body, the more I want to tell you that the evil one will try to disrupt our unity, won't he? Paul says it will be like being tossed back and forth by the waves. Have you ever gone to the beach and got caught on the wrong side of a wave? I wanted to be on top of the wave with my boogie board, and all of a sudden the wave was crashing down on me. And I was upside down and all around, and, and I was out of control. It's scary to be out of control. Have you ever driven on an icy road and hit an icy patch and done like three 360s, and then you're okay and you kept going? Well, maybe that was just me. But I, but I felt, I, you know, you feel, you feel totally out of control. That's what Paul says when we're not being Christ's body in the right way, driven by love, driven by the salvation. We're tossed and will be susceptible to anything. You know, we, we've got a hard task, and we're going to have to be together to get it done. The church has a pretty big black eye right now, doesn't it, in the world? Not just the Catholic denomination. Have you read the articles coming out about the Baptist? Over seven, eight hundred thousand accounts of sexual abuse by leaders, pastors, youth pastors, deacons. Tammy says she's not surprised. She's been counseling victims of this for years. That's the message right now out there about what church is like. But it's not what the Bible says. We're to be together and undergirding and loving each other and loving this world and making this world right in God's eyes, not destroying it. So Baptists, we're not under any national creed. It's not top to bottom. We're our own local church. But I tell you, as pastor of your church, there's zero tolerance for any of that. And we'll take it right to the deacon body and we'll decide what needs to happen in church discipline if there is. Because it's not how God wants us to be. So when we go astray or when you lose your, your, your drive or when you lose your joy of being a part of a church, remember that church is a treasure. And 
This is, there's other passages in Scripture, but this part, first part of Ephesians 4, it's what I like. It's a good owner's manual to go back to as a church member. Owner man, owner's manuals are like that to remind us, you know, how to fix something. How many of you, you know, uh, I just had to get a new used vehicle. How many of you get a new used or new car, and the very first thing you do, uh, what I did is I, I sat out in the dealer for the next hour, and I pulled out the owner's manual, and I read it thoroughly. I wanted to know what every button did, you know, what to look for, all the warnings. Or how about when you get a brand new cell phone? You know, I, I usually sit there and I read the owner's manual to want to know exactly how, no, maybe you're different than me. The first thing I did was jump in that car and drove it. I want to see how it handled the corners and the highway and how it breaks and how much fun I was going to have. I was pushing all kinds of buttons to see what they would do. And the same with the phone. You know, I, I cut that thing on. I want to see it light up and it's pretty and, and all these things it can do and what I can do with it. And, and, but there's going to come a time when I'm going to say, why isn't this vehicle doing this? Why is it messing up? Why is this light on? On the phone, you know, what else could this phone do? And I might go back to the owner's manual and get readjusted. Oh, you mean if I only pushed that button, you know, I'd have gotten 10 more miles to the gallon? I should have known that. <laughs> you know, you go back to the Bible. Oh, you mean if I just, you know, you know, forget that church is not about me but about Jesus that have been better all these years? Why didn't I do that? You mean if I prayed about that? That that would have helped? I forgot that. i got to go back to the owner's manual. When we do, we realize church is a gift and a treasure. We'll move on. But let's not forget, as we go through this year of discipleship, what being a church member is all about. We'll start next week on the disciplines of a disciple. What do we need to do? to be better disciples of Jesus. Let's pray together. Lord God, thank you for this day, the many testimonies, the, your spirit moving, your great message. Lord, let us um, just uh, take this into our hearts. Give us courage to obey. In your name we pray, amen.